Okay. We good? Okay. <clears throat> On behalf of the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the Russell Sage Foundation, and Duke University, it is my pleasure to welcome Monica Lee. Um, Monica is a data scientist at Facebook. Um, she's been doing, she's been there for some years now, um, working on a variety of, of topics around politics, uh, especially uh, civic engagement and um, also elections and, um, and also election uh, misinformation spread and, and fraud. Um, and so um, she's got a wealth of experience um, with data that uh, many of us would, would, would dream to look at. Um, but she's also, you know, uh, a, a really top-notch social scientist, and um, she comes out of a tradition that we haven't had much exposure to as a group here yet, um, and and that is um, cultural sociology and social network analysis. We've talked a bit about uh, social network analysis, especially when we talked about automated text analysis in a previous live-streamed video. Um, but um, Monica's really taking this to a new level because. Um, the networks are just richer and better and more phenomenal inside Facebook. And so she's got a number of interesting um, ways of extending the, um, the methods, but also the theory. And so one of the neat things about cultural sociology is people like Monica um, have been um, leading the charge to develop more formal ways of measuring culture and thinking about culture. And so we are um, really happy to have her here today to talk to us about from the culture structure duality to community detection via graph embedding. So please join me in welcoming Monica. Thanks. Thank you for that kind introduction, Chris. Great to see you again. So um, good afternoon. I'm Monica, sociologist by training, graduated from Chicago about three and a half years ago. That's about how long I've been at Facebook. So by profession, I'm the core data science lead on election integrity at Facebook. Um, I've come here today to do hopefully two things. First, I want to tell you a story about how ideas become enriched by being used in both academic and industry settings. And I also want to teach you about dual matrix transformations and developing graph embeddings as a way to solve community detection problems. I know that sounds like a lot. Hopefully it all comes together. So along the way, I hope I'm able to drive home the broader point that a great deal of what you're learning right now in grad school and academia is actually really useful in an industry setting, at least in my little corner of the tech industry. So my story is about a prime example of this usefulness. How a simple theoretical idea rooted in Breiger 1974, duality of persons and groups. How many people in this room have read this? Oh my god, not that many, OK? <laughs> it's going to be hard. Um, so can, let's say, anyway, it's rooted in a simple theoretical idea in this article. Um, and it's been continually, continually developed by me and, in the middle, John Levy Martin with the pipe um, in a couple different articles um, Sorry. So we developed this further in a couple different articles that, and, and later this became the basis for a fundamentally new approach to community detection that's useful for election integrity work, where I'm closely collaborating with, that's Bogdan Stata over there, who graduated from Stanford Sociology just a couple years ago, and we work on this stuff together. So for those who aren't familiar, the Breiger duality is expressed here in this notation at the top, right? In English, we would say that if you multiply a two-mode matrix by its transpose, you can transform it into a one-mode matrix based on the second mode. So using the simple transformation, we can sort of traverse between two potential networks, or like three, actually, right? One for each mode based on the other. Um, and those can be joined by the two-mode matrix, matrix that is their joint expression. Over, over there, it's a P by G, right? Breiger applied the transformation, this transformation to associational matrices, showing how a person by group matrix, P by G, can be expressed as a person by person matrix based on the number of shared group memberships um, that the two people share, as well as a group by group matrix. If you multiply you know, M prime M, you get a group by group matrix based on sharing common members. So, um, it's basically, the groups, like the G by G matrix, will tell you how many common members are shared between any two groups. So if there's anything that the last 45 or so years of formal sociology has taught us, it's that this transformation, which allows us to sort of hinge together multiple networks, has an almost unlimited applications. It's certainly not limited to thinking about associational matrices. One other really great application for the Breiger duality, uh, John Martin and I posit, 
is computing, quantifying, and measuring textual meaning at scale. In a recent article, the Riger duality became our foundation for trying to figure out how to capture multiplex meaning in texts. Now, of course, Breiger's case was about associations, persons, and groups, not about the meaning of texts. But there's no reason you can't apply his basic framework to the case of, say, authors and the ideas that they write about. Just like people have an important implicit connection to one another um, when they are members of the same groups, people also have an important implicit connection to one another when they think and believe lots of the same things. So the, mean, the thing about meaning that makes it difficult to capture is that it's complicated. Or more accurately, it's complex. The meaning of a text is inherently multiplex as well as relational. Meaning is discoverable in, for instance, the words that are in the text, especially in relation to the words that are not in the text. That's why we think of TFIDF as a valid operation. Meaning is discoverable in the arrangement of words within the text. This is like a word co-occurrence network. It's meaningful that certain words are always or very seldom used together. Meaning is also discoverable in terms of the other people referenced in it. This is the basis of our classic citation network work. Right? Meaning is also discoverable by thinking about a text author. The text came out of a certain movement, a certain workshop, a certain department. And now that I think you've probably caught my train of reasoning on this, you can probably recognize that I could list these for quite a while. So the big question for us is, how can we combine these networks into a unified methodology that helps us discover meaning in some sort of unified way? So that paper, Doorway to the Dharma of Duality, came out, I think, two weeks ago. And I'll walk you through some of its highlights. We take the duality through three new phases of transformation that allow us to enrich any one network with the information from an additional, and yet another additional, and another and another, until basically we're exhausted. So, Let's start with the classic, the Breiger classic duality about persons and groups and refit it to our understanding of authors and the words they write about. Because if pushed to its logical extremes, this type of operation could be the one that, to help us find multiplex meaning right, in a text. So the original article, Duality of Persons and Groups, it basically throws down this idea that if you take a two-mode associational matrix that represents where people belong to a group, P by G, you can multiply that matrix by its transpose, mm prime, to transform it into a person by person matrix based on the number of group memberships each pair of person shares. This gives you a notion of how close to each other people are in terms of their associational patterns, right? Their group memberships. And this is one important facet of their relationship to one another. So if you multiply the transpose by the matrix m prime, m, prime m, then you get the mirror image, a group by group matrix that tells you how many members each pair of groups has in common, which is one important facet of the group's relationship to one another, their degree of overlap. So our proposition is that the same exact operation works for finding meaning in authors and the ideas they write about. Like in the article, I'll use a simplified example of the Frankfurt School of Social Theory. Its members, um, and also some of the key ideas they, they write about to illustrate some of these methods. So say we're gonna start with a four by three matrix, X here, composed of four authors, Adorno, Fromm, Max, and Marcuse. Um, and we have M ideas. Oh, that's, I'm sorry, that should be N by M in the first, <laughs> I'm sorry about that, N by M. Um, sorry, okay, and then, and then M ideas, three ideas, right, reason, labor, and art. Um, and we can see that Adorno writes about reason and, so does, and, and art, and so does Fromm, right? Max writes about all three concepts, Marcuse, just reason and labor. Um, you can transform this two-mode matrix by um, taking XX prime, and we can turn it by a four by four matrix, N by N, right? And this shows us how many ideas each pair of authors mutually writes about. This is, in some sense, the author's ideational relationships to one another, the extent to which they're interested in the same ideas. We can likewise transform this two-mode matrix um, into X prime X. So it's a three by three matrix, that's M by M now, that shows how many people write about both ideas together, combines each pair of ideas in their text. So people related, so people related reason to art, right? Three, to, or three times, reason to labor twice. Um, art to labor, art to labor once, yeah. And this is the network version of the classic Breiger two-mode network, linking authors and the, the ideas that they write about. This is the network that when we take the classic approach, uh, we get meaning from. 
Now, next step, right? That, that previously was just like all Brager applied to text. But our next step, we can elaborate on this with a transition to what we call the mega Brager, where we vectorize a matrix and insert it into our first matrix. So if we start with an impoverished version of meaning, where we only know who wrote about which idea, and then implicitly, which ideas are shared by which people, now we can ask a next question. What combinations of ideas does each author write about? You know, we call this the mega sociocultural meaning, represented by matrix N by M by M. So if Breiger Classic could show you which people, oh, sorry. Sorry, if Breiger Classic could show you which people write about which ideas, which people write about common ideas, and which ideas are associated through a set of authors, we can go one step further and ask, um, does, which ideas does each author choose to associate with one another? So I'm going really visual here. This obviously is not how it works in math or in computing, but um, I want you to focus conceptually on what's going on here. In a figurative sense, all we're doing is replacing that top array of M ideas with this entire M by M matrix, right? Like up at the top of the column. And so the cell for Adorno by M by M matrix isn't just a number, but it is itself a whole implicit matrix that identifies which ideas, um, that identifies which ideas um, Adorno is actually associating in his work what he actually connects in the text, right? So here Adorno writes about reason and art, combining these ideas through his writing. Fromm likewise combines these ideas and only these ideas. We can move down to Max's matrix and he writes about all three, so he's all ones. And then Marcuse only combines reason and labor, so that's why his matrix looks, looks like that. Um, and as you can see, if you add up all these internal cells, you get the matrix at the top. Um, and just so we don't forget, the little vector version of everything on the right of the little blue arrow um, is reminding us that when we actually calculate these things, we use them as vectors, not matrices. So what Mega Breiger is now telling us is that meaning isn't just about which individual ideas an author addresses, yes or no reason, yes or no labor. Even better, it's, about, it's also about which subset of ideas the author decided to combine. Adorno finds reason relevant for explaining art. That's what that means. They are associated ideas. And because Fromm and Max also seem to think reason, and, and is, reason is relevant for explaining art, um, the three of them have something in common, right? In counterdistinction to Marcuse, who doesn't seem to agree that reason is relevant for exp uh, explaining art. He only thinks it's relevant for explaining labor. So he's the odd man out in this set. That's what mega sociocultural meaning is. And we can take this mega Breiger and look at it in network form. As you can see, we've now added to the classic network an edge type, M by M. You know, we have these new green edges now that are idea to idea. We're eking meaning now, mega meaning comes from this two mode matrix with two sets of edges. Now you see, Adorno connects reason and art, right? Um, so for that reason, the re and, and so does Fromm and so does Max. And so for that reason, that little green edge between reason and art would be of weight three. Um, Marcuse and Max both think that they both connect the ideas of reason and labor, and so reason and labor, edge weight, the green edge, is two. And then finally, the edge weight between um, labor and reason, which only Marcuse thinks is relevant, is an edge weight of one. So Mega Reiger showed us how we could traverse two matrices and their combinations to think about meaning from four different directions. But meaning has far more than four layers. When we go into Mondo Breiger phase, as we call it, we pick up another couple of layers. We've looked at authors and the ideas they write about. Now let's add a citation matrix too. Because I don't, have, I don't think I have to explain in detail that there's, some, there's an additional facet of textual meaning available through examining the authors that are cited in a text. Um, and perhaps even more meaning when we examine the ways that various authors combine ideas with citations as they attempt to explain these ideas. So to our mega matrix, which is actually, the first two columns are just like the mega matrix, we can imagine adding such a citation network to the mix. Now we have three entity types. We have N authors, M ideas, and O citations. Let's look at N by O by M, where we analyze how N authors on the left-hand panel, like our, our same four, um, uh, like connect and I, so, so we take the four authors and look at the, uh, how they connect an M idea with an O citation. So that's the upper right um, cell. So O by M in the upper right cell represents where citations and ideas appear textually alongside each other. 
if Freud associates uh, with, if Freud is associated with reason three times, it means that three authors out of our four believe that citing Freud is relevant to a conversation about reason. As you can see in the internal cells, those three are Fromm, Mex, and Marcuse. All four authors seem to think Kant and Plato are relevant to his dis uh, a discussion of reason. And only one author thinks Plato is relevant to the discussion of art, and that's Fromm. And as you can see, just like in the mega version, you can add up those matrices at the bottom and it'll add up to the what's at the top. So it becomes just like with the n by m by m that we, um, like, that we just looked at previously and is on the left, except now we're combining ideas and citations, not just ideas with other ideas. So accordingly, going to the network view, this is what our network looks like now, right? We've added these red squares and red edges, and these are the citations. Red edges represent idea citation ties where an author is cited alongside an idea. We are now then getting textual meaning. The Mondo, Mondo Riger, Mondo sociocultural citational meaning is coming out of this network. Um, so all four authors cite Plato with reason, Kant with reason, so we have edges weight four. Between them, Kant, uh, sorry, three cite Freud with reason, weight three. Freud and labor discussed together twice, weight two. Freud and art, three, yeah, you know, what, you, I think you get the picture. Um, so finally, we get to the Fulbrighter, which is in some sense merely the ultimate realization that there's nothing keeping us from continuing to layer, you know, like in the Mondo step, matrices upon matrices, networks on networks, modes on top of modes, and continually traverse them um, in all types of directions to enrich our initially quite impoverished formal approach to measuring meaning. So we could, for instance, think about distinct documents from authors. It's not just about whether Adorno cites Kant, even further, in what particular documents, works, does Adorno discuss reason? Or, you know, this is like the, the, the duck by M matrix, D by M, that we put in the upper right. Uh, or in what documents does, uh, so, what, sorry, what, what, when does he, in what documents does he discuss reason? In what documents does he discuss Kant? That would be theoretically D by O. Um, so is this part of a, is, is part of a text meaning um, also inherent in the documents that these ideas are written in versus the documents that, it, that it's not. So we could also add journals in the very far right, right? Like lots of publications are articles. In what journals do we see a lot of articles in which Adorno cites Kant or discuss art? Um, is part of a text meaning also inherent in the journal in which it was published? And as you can see, as we do this, this is starting to look more and more like a normal matrix, you know, with a bunch of columns and a bunch of rows. And what I want you to understand fundamentally is this, that whatever we can do with any single mode matrix, we can still do with this full Fulbrighter matrix, as long as we can imagine that all the cells are containing vectors or matrices instead of single numbers. But this Fulbrighter conclusion, we can call it, we always knew, is no conclusion at all. Although in our initial work, we could like sort of come up with these ad, ad hoc algebraic ways to move around among these networks to answer some specific questions, um, we were far from fully understanding what we were doing, why it mattered, how we could even build this into something systematic as a single model. And then, you know, meanwhile, much about what I do at work, like at work work. Um, I think this says a lot. Uh, pretty much right after we finished that article, really two articles, uh, the two, uh, 2016 election happened. And at the time, I was one of two political researchers at the company, very quickly became like the only and the lead R&D type researcher working on understanding and combating platform abuse during elections. I ended up start helping to start a team that focused on election abuses, specifically misinformation, false, amplica false amplification, which is like astroturfing, impersonations, misrepresentation, harassment, election-related violence, account security, voter disenfranchisement, kind of all under one roof, right? And of course, with the specters of the Russians hanging over everything. I worked on things I never thought I would work on before, like busting lots of fake accounts ahead of the French election, busting networks of Macedonian fake news ahead of the Alabama special election. And in the course of trying to figure out how to unearth foreign meddling, identify fake accounts, generally find malicious actors, I had a first epiphany that community detection is a very important method, perhaps the most important method for discovering adversaries. Network science is super life important which was to me really exciting because I never had such a good, clear use for community detection in, in academia. I don't know about you, but community detection for me was my first data love. So powerful, right, to throw all this data into this machine and view it 
view the world from this ecosystem level perspective. You have these clumps, you get to read them like tea leaves, speculate wildly, it's great, right? But you know what community detection never was? It was never rigorous, it was never well defined, it was never well evaluated, and it was never optimized. In large part because unless you're doing, very, like doing community detection in very specific circumstances, there usually isn't a good practical use case, like a set of well-defined ground truth examples of communities to discover to improve your model to drive methodological development. But I tell you what, one of those very specific circumstances, election integrity. Another one, probably counterterrorism, but I'll leave that one to others. Um, Second epiphany, that much like textual meaning, what creates a community is also inherently multiplex and relational. It's another case in which if we could figure out a way to effectively combine information from multiple graphs, we could do extraordinary things. Think about it this way. Meaning can be discovered through some triangulation of the words in author rights, the relationships among those words, the social relationships among authors, citational relationships, and on and on. Communities are also cultural constructs with a multiplex definition. What makes a donut baking community, right? Well, each person has a relationship to donuts, but that's not enough. Those people also need to know and interact with each other, right? It's not a community at all. But that's probably still not enough. In the very least, they need to be baking donuts while interacting with each other, right? And on top of that, maybe there are certain preferences for donut flavor or a specific definition of donuts. Eclairs and bear claws are not donuts, only cake, not risen, whatever. That really separates one community from the next. Either way, you can see community detection can be understood as a very similar exercise to discovering textual meaning. It's all about finding the areas where a bunch of thematically connected networks seem to overlap. Finally, third epiphany that may come from just hanging out with computer scientists all day now, embeddings. Embeddings may be the best way to project the spatial explosion of data that takes place when you want to leverage the sum total insight from multiple potential networks. Remember where we left off, right? When pursuing meaning, Breiger-wise, we offered some matrix algebra. Works in theory, works in, to, to eke out meaning in some ad hoc applications, but there's no unified model. At work, I was seeing people use embeddings for all types of things because they're a convenient way to spatially scale lots of variables, and that's it. Like, that's the only reason. They didn't think of embeddings as a way to rigorously define inherently abstract cultural concepts. So it seems a good time to connect the dots. But why embeddings first, right? Well, first, embeddings are particularly good tools for reducing dimensionality of high dimension spaces. You might know about embeddings from word to vec Who in this room knows word to vec at least a little bit? A little bit? Oh, okay, good that I'm explaining. Okay, <laughs> exactly the same idea. So in word to vec you turn every word in a co-occurrence matrix basically into a vector, um, its own dimension. So you get, even in a short text, thousands of dimensions. Uh, now you have to find a way to reduce all these dimensions into something really manageable. A quick and simple example right here. Say we have a text with five sentences, each of which is treated like a discrete window of text. We have this partial word co-occurrence matrix, just three words again, same three words, right? We have vectors at the top representing usages of the word reason, labor, and art in these five sentences. Uh, reason is in sentences one, three, four, and five. Labor in one, three, five. Art in one, two, and four. And then the internal cells represent the windows where each word overlaps, where they co-reside. As you can see, reason and labor overlap in three sentences uh, in positions one, three, and five. Uh, reason and art meet each other in two sentences, one and four. Art and labor are only combined in one sentence, the first. And so when we put this into an embedding, the space ends up looking something like this on the right. Spatial distribution is expressed as a cosine distance um, in the space, and this distance represents how often words are used in the same context, here in the same sentence. So since labor and reason are used together thrice, they're pretty close to each other. Reason and art were used together only twice, so they're a bit further apart than labor and reason. Uh, and then finally, labor and art are used together only once, so they're the furthest apart among the three relationships. Basically, embeddings just allow us to take thousands of dimensions and reduce them into one single space that's inherently a model that produces a single quantitative metric, a cosine similarity that represents how structurally similar any two words are. Now, but we can embed, you know, alongside words, why not? Also non-word objects, which is something you almost certainly have to do if you want to use embeddings for community detection. Going back to our early example of some Frankfurt School members, the ideas they write about and the citations they cite, let's recast Frankfurt as a community detection problem. 
and imagine these matrices as an embedding space, as a new embedding space called, for the sake of it for now, topic to VEC. Say we want to detect which authors in the set are in the same philosophical school. And we've decided that being in a school together means that the authors are intellectually similar. Reasonable, right? They care about the same topics. We can create an embedding space that encompasses many relevant data points about intellectual interests. That's this topic to VEC. We could include in the space, oops, we could include in the space these two mode matrices. Author writes about an idea, um, author cites notation, and by, or sorry, author cites a citation, and by O, idea appears alongside a citation, and by O. Um, oh, jeez. So this basically is a, a Mondo, oh shoot, I'm sorry, I can't. Sorry, this is basically a Mondo Breiger. So remember the net on the right. Um, so, Okay, sorry. So sorry, um, so we have these explicit edges. We also have these implicit edges from this space that have an effect on the spatial composition of the embedding. When we look at authors' connections to certain ideas and citations, we get information about how similar any two authors are in terms of ideas and citations. When we look at who writes um, about <laughs> ideas and the citations used to explain them, we learn something about ideas' relationships to one another. When we look at who cites another author and what ideas appear alongside a certain citation, we get information about which citations have a similar intellectual relevance. And on top of this, there's no reason you need to remain within any single entity type. You can sort of traverse all those relationships as well, um, like all of them. So this information is a commonly in one embedding, so it comes possible to talk about a philosophical school not just as people, but some combination of authors, the ideas they write about, and the other authors they cite, which is probably a more correct way to think about the phenomenon of an intellectual school. Finally, like any usage of embeddings, we get an output of a single number. While word to vec would posit that the cosine similarity in a text, um, in, in a text embedding means that these words are similar in meaning, cosine similarity in a space constructed for community detection means that two persons are likely to be in the same community. In topic to VEC, we can, call it, we can think about it as intellectual solidarity among any pair of entities, whether author, idea, or citation. So we can use this metric quite simply to, indu to inductively detect communities. The easiest way to find an intellectual community via something like our topic to VEC space is to just grab all the entities that are closer to each other um, in the embedding space than some threshold. Um, in some high information sense, it means that they orbit around the common ideas and citations. Say that we pick 0 0.7, so we grab all the nodes whose similarity to one another is greater than or equal to 0 0.7. It's like the easiest community detection algorithm ever. Um, but one of the most exciting, and really what's exciting about this, is that this project has made us realize um, is that embedding is maybe useful for negative deployments. One of the best ways to detect community is by offering high a, a first high recall definition and then using cosine distance in an embedding space to prune the lowest confidence edges. So let me be more concrete. Take, for example, a pretty broadly shared truism that authors who cite one another constitute the same intellectual school. Um, but, if we were but if it were just true that um, a connected component in a citation network is uh, as such is sufficient evidence of community, then we'd have very large communities indeed. You know, imagine that everybody who cites the strength of weak ties as being called a network analyst in the same community as Granovet, right? It doesn't make any sense. But if we have an embedding space that summarizes topical commonality, you know, authors write about the same topics, cite the same others, then we could very easily leverage the information in the embedding to prune the original connected component of co-citations to a more reasonable and precise community. And suddenly you just layered your embedding on top of a network, right? So we can take this um, connected component of citations and filter out the edges with a cosine similarity less than 0 0.7. We end up with two smaller, denser communities that are both aligned in terms of their citations of each other as well as their topics of interest. I like to think of this as cutting off the weak bridging ties, right? Pretty much the primary function of graph partitioning, actually. Well, this, this, I argue, is a better way to find community. Um, so you basically propose some relational definition, understood as high recall, eliminate the false negatives with a cosine similarity threshold in a high information space. So also with embeddings, once you have a number on it, guess what you can do, right? You can validate community detection like a simple and straightforward supervised machine learning problem. 
If you're using an embedding space approach, the only missing piece is to find ground truth examples of communities. So I'll be honest, I think that when you're doing anything besides hunting down adversary organizations, examples may be elusive, but I don't think they're impossible. Maybe a lot of coding, right, manual coding. Then we can evaluate like any, then we can evaluate that prediction like any other predictive modeling problem. Think about it this way, each entity we place in an intellectual school via an embedding approach is merely an instance of prediction. Our prediction is high precision when it can identify edges that belong together in a community without adding one, anyone into the bucket who doesn't belong. Recall is simply the ability to identify a large portion of the entities that belong together. And, then, and when you can optimize your community prediction by just kind of sliding down this continuous scale that we just created, you can actually ask, you can go up to 0.8 cosine similarity and see how your precision and recall are falling. You can go down to 0.6 and see what happens there. Uh, it's really easy then to find that sweet spot, your high F1 score, and we can understand exactly the quality of our detection model. It's 70% precision, it's 80% recall. Um, on average across communities tested. So the next step in our journey is optimization. Basically, my computer science friends seem to think that you can dump unlimited amounts of data, edge types, entity types, whatever, and into an embedding space, and it just doesn't matter. Noise ends up orthogonal, cancels itself out across the space. More is better, more is always better. I'm pretty darn sure that's totally wrong. And embeddings work better when we can figure out how to select edges that are clean and provide new and appropriate information instead of noise and redundancy. So lucky for me that back a couple years ago, John and I wrote two articles, not one. The second is an information theory-based approach to understanding which matrices among an overlapping set actually provide new inferential information versus generate noise. And this is the next thing that we're gonna make an empirical and engineering reality. So in conclusion, I'm not gonna read the whole story, right? It's all, I, the story, which I summarized here, is essentially about how an idea changes and indeed gains significance when you move it through multiple research contexts and practical applications. We do get smarter and we do get better at things. The first lesson was about the Breiger duality. You know, is invented to look at associational ties. It can be furthered in many ways and meaningfully applied to any situation in which we need to leverage information from traversing multiple networks. One good example is discovering textual meaning. Another quite exciting new one is community detection. The second lesson was, the best, uh, was that the best method I currently see of handling and reducing the spatial explosion of data that comes from trying to handle multiplex networks is embeddings. It can, create a ton of inf uh, it can integrate a ton of information and output a metric that's simple and very flexibly useful. Uh, and so I will just conclude by saying but the, the spirit around my, my portion of the tech industry right now is bet all the things. <laughs> okay. Okay, first question is, can I take a picture of that? Mm -hmm. That's great, okay. Thank you. Um, can we cut the uh, live stream, please, Greg?